Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Wide Open Throttle. And joining me, Johnny Lieberman, Ed Lowe, David Freiberger, and Ron Kino. And it's been a pretty exciting time if you're in the American automotive media business because we've just come off the launch of the all new C7 Corvette, an event that doesn't come around very often. And guys, what's the verdict? David's the only one here who's actually, I, I drove one, but it's limited to 11 miles an hour. So. <laughs> yeah. I, the verdict for me is it's a Corvette, which is a loaded statement because I think they don't necessarily want it to be a Corvette right now. You know what I mean? They're seeking a new audience with that car. They're trying to get to the younger people. And so is the name a stigma? And I think that's why they've designed it so radically differently and given it a whole bunch of technology, which I think really improved the car. I mean, the stats on the car are pretty impressive. It's better in every way. It's got more horsepower, 460 for the base Stingray, um, 465 foot-pounds of torque. So there's, there's significant boosts in power and torque. And the area under the curve there is really the big story because the direct injection motor makes a lot more low-end torque than the old engine. So they actually say it's better than an old LS7 in the mid-range. Well, I mean, that yeah, I mean, that's interesting you mentioned the uh, nice little chart here. But um, 480... Yeah. <laughs> 480 uh, pound-feet of torque for the Z06, 465 for the, again, the base engine with the, you know, the active muffler. But I mean, that's you know, only 15 pound-feet of torque different. That's really good. I mean, you're basically almost getting Z06 performance on the standard car, which, is, which means can't wait for the next Z06. Well, yeah, this, exactly. this kind of <laughs> splits the difference between the, the C6 Grand Sport and the C6 Z06. So it's kind of split the difference. So you expect the Z06 to to actually go one better again. But let's go back to your statement. What, what do you mean it's, you know, it's a Corvette? And, and what, like, why is that in this day and age a double-edged sword? Well, I think their big problem is their traditional customer base, which honestly is older. It's the guy who wanted to buy a new LT1 Stingray in 1970, and now he can afford one. And I have challenged them on this. Actually, I said, why are you bringing back Stingray? Why are you bringing back the name LT1 when those are callbacks to the past when what you're trying to do is advance this car into the future? And they gave me an interesting answer, which was they did market research and found that Stingray didn't resonate as an old thing to younger people because they didn't know it existed. And it's simply a cool name now. So it's win-win. They, it's get, a they win, get the old win. dude and the young kid to have no idea. Right. Like, oh, it's a shark. Which is interesting to me because I could be wrong, but I looked over all my photos after I came back from the press event. It doesn't say Stingray anywhere on the car. It, it, just, has, has, it, just, it has, has the, the fish. fish. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting. I feel like I've almost acclimated to America because I've lived here now for one Corvette generation. And I can remember coming here to drive and the C6 had just been launched and getting into the car and being staggered by it. I mean, it smelled like you walked into a surf shop. Um, it had a piece of black curtain over the, the back. and it, cheap, it just, cheap black curtain. Yeah, and, and it just felt crude. And, and it had rock hard tires on it and it had seats that didn't hold you in. And I've, I've thought about it over the time. I wonder whether GM was listening to the voice of the customer and the customer was that older guy who is now you know, carrying a bit of condition and uh, <laughs> he doesn't want to replace tires on his car you know, every 60,000 miles. So, you know, you ended up with with a car that looked like a sports car, but really wasn't. I it, think this thing's a lot closer to being a real sports car. It, but even in your old interpretation of that car, it was still the best sports car America had to offer, right? Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and in that and in that generation, it, it went through a, uh, like a, a, a massive, massive yeah. uh, you know, evolution. You know, it went from, you know, just and some of that's tire technology, but also, you well, know, we, in Z06, Z01, I mean, just the I mean, the Z06, Z06 I, we, when I remember when that, you know, that was a real statement. Suddenly, it's like we're using magnesium and aluminum in the chassis. Super lightweight. It's lighter than a 911. It's well, the engine seven too had you know yeah. the, the connecting rods were titanium. I mean, yeah, salt, very sodium high filled tech. exhaust yeah. valves. It was really Z06 high tech. or ZR1. Z06. Z06. Yeah, Z06. Yeah, well, really, I can, really high tech. But I think I think we've um, pushed them a little on tires as well. I can remember our very first best drivers car testing with with the car. You know, those Goodyear Eagles were rock hard and the. On the limit, the breakaway was very sudden. It was just not pleasant to drive. And we said, look, here's a great chassis waiting for a good set of tires. And so it's been gratifying. Now you can get cup tires on your Corvette just like you can on your Porsche 911. So it says to me there's a real sports car mindset. Yeah, now too, I mean, the standard tire, the only tire is the Michelin. Mm -hmm. you know, they've gone away from Goodyear, which has been their tire for... Right. They I mean, put the a lot Firestone of Goodyear. I mean, now, now it's just Michelin, and that's, that's a big step for them. 
Yeah, God. and the Michelins are better. I mean, better God bless better. France. Yeah, exactly. I know you're, <laughs> you're going right with the French tires. <laughs> what is your take? I mean, me not having the experience with all the exotics as you do, and looking at the electronics in the car, are they truly as sophisticated as they seem, or are they playing catch up to the Europeans? No, uh, they're as sophisticated. They're 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 leading edge, a bleeding edge. I mean, uh, for a rear wheel drive car. Oh yeah, so, absolutely. Sure. And you know. Um, Chevy's been ahead of the curve on a lot of this technology, the magneto rheological shocks, the the, the, the the fluid. I mean, Ferrari licensed them you know, after they developed them. So, we, I mean, we did a test uh, uh, three years ago with uh, Justin Bell and uh, ZR1, and it had uh, the, the, the first iteration of the performance traction management, right? And, you know, Justin's a pretty good driver, took him to Big Willow, and he was, like, I forget, like a tenth faster with actually everything on, but in full, you know, go fast mode. And he said something really interesting afterwards. He said, you know, if I had 10 more laps, I could be faster with everything off. I'd return the car in pieces, but I could be yeah. faster. <laughs> right. But even Frank, Frank said uh, in, in our review of it, it's these things are, I mean, they're kind of like they're fighter jets. Like you, once you, you drive it and then you turn everything off and then you start spinning out. And, and That's exactly the what corners. they did to me. Right. I mean, yeah. it's the fly by wire at this point. They're, they're like intentionally unstable. Well, the computer because you need that sort of instability to get a car to turn in quickly but then you need you know the reactions of out and center to catch it <laughs> they, but they make you learn to drive the car differently because the thing with the traction management that i'd never experienced is you hit corner apex and you just go straight to what and yes. don't worry yeah, about it it's, it's an edif it's yeah, not yeah. gonna lock up and just weird? you learn to do that after a little while and they turn all that stuff off and you're in the ditch every single time i thought the coolest Crazy. thing with the edif was monitoring the valve uh, tire temperature, tire temperature, oh, yeah. and then varying the ha the, the way the. You know, I know. I, I think I know one of the big reasons they do that because I remember uh, that same test. The ZR1 I took over my brother-in-law's house, and you know, we we're gonna go drive it, but it actually wound up sitting for about five hours. We went to a movie or something. Got in there, I'm like, check this out, and like tires were frozen. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So oh really? <laughs> car was fine. Okay. Yeah, we called us that. Car was fine. You know, but it was like, oh, let me warm up the tires, oh, then we'll accelerate yeah, the straight okay, line. Yeah, it yeah. changes a lot of algorithms on the temperature, the the throttle progression and the braking and the ELSD and the PTM. It's kind of amazing. And that and that's really clever stuff. And I think you know this C7 Corvette could be the first Corvette in a long, long time where we can all sit back and say this is a great sports car without putting the usual qualifier that we always put on Corvettes for the money. It, yeah. Period. But let's get out of empirical data and say, is it cool? Do you guys think it well, looks cool? Do let's, you like well, the design? Hold on, let's, let's flip it back on you in the same vein. You're the hot rod guy. You know, this is going to be a car that maybe some of you guys might work on when it comes on to the used market in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, is it, does it piss you off? It's a DI motor. It's got all these electronics in it, all these sensors. Is this something that you just I'm not touching Turns that. into a force. Oh, over. it certainly doesn't <laughs> piss me off. There's a whole lot of our readers who are affluent enough to have their several hundred thousand dollar hot rod and they drive these things every single day. There's a ton of them. Um, the DI engine is a challenge to the aftermarket for sure. And I've talked to a lot of guys, you know, Lingenfelter and Redline and uh, even Hennessy at this point. I was like, oh, we've broken the code in the computer. I'm like, well, that's nice. What about the fuel delivery? Because that's really the issue is getting enough fuel flow out of the mechanical pump to increase horsepower. So that is going to be a challenge for us. But you guys have to yeah. crack that. I mean, the... Oh, it'll happen. The aftermarket has not been stumped yet. <laughs> no, but it's just going to be time. Okay, well, I, I, personally, I like the way the new car looks. I think you need to keep pushing it along. It needs to be edgier, more contemporary. They've done that, even though some people, you know, they don't like the lights have changed. Well, guess what? You know, they've changed over the years. Yeah, so I went, don't ask, I went through and read all 188 comments on the print piece this morning. Oh, yeah. and, and I would say half of our comments were um, about how it looks, and they were negative. Yep, yeah. us too. Yeah, overwhelmingly. And you know, I've, we've we've all seen the car in, in person. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like a, it's it's like you know, damn if you do, damn if you don't. If they didn't change it, if it looked yeah. like an evolution yeah. of the C6, it'd be, yeah. it'd be the 911 it, critique. It's, oh, it it's this changed. it's the shock of the new. Yes. And you know, in, in yeah. three years' time, people will be looking back and saying, "Man, that Corvette looks good." I can remember when the E46 3 Series came out. Everyone said, "Ho oh, hum, a boring BMW." When the Chris Bangle cars turned up, everyone was saying, "Oh my God, I wish that." that we're building the E46 again. Anyway. People have zero imagination. They, you know, when all that has to happen is the, is the Z06 or the Z01, when it comes out and it's like, you know, half an inch, an inch lower, oh, yeah, a little bit yeah, bigger yeah. wheels, a cool yeah, lip well, spoiler. Maybe People the gonna be black like, plastic stuff gets replaced by a little Holy little crap, yeah, yeah, they'll get over it. Well, that'll be something worth waiting for. Moving along uh, from Corvettes to muscle trucks and minibikes, which were the subject 
oddly enough, of the, the latest episode of Roadkill. And uh, what a weird combination. Well, see how things mesh here? The, <laughs> the muscle truck, actually, is it's a 73 Chevy short bed step side. It has a Corvette engine in it, as a Z06 motor, it's LS6. It, there's just a history of hot rodding, taking Corvette parts and applying them to what we do. So, Mark, does everyone know the Zora of Arcus Duntoff story about how his memo to management that essentially said, Chevrolet, you need to get in hot rodding? Um, pretty interesting about how you know that day in 1955 is where Chevrolet and hot rodding linked together. Anyway, and that ends up with me with this Corvette engine in my truck, which we used for an episode of Roadkill. <laughs> See how I hooked that together? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you and Zora like that. Yeah, we're like that. Exactly. I, I met him once. It was a proud day. Um, but anyway, this was yet another one of my old project vehicles that we had sitting around forever and ever gathering dirt in the corner. And so we just knocked the weeds off of it and, and uh, threw a couple mini bikes in the back and went drag racing. It's a pretty simple <laughs> episode. It's sort of a utility oh, episode, getting those, done what we need to do. Those are your mini bikes in the, in the back. The old yeah, oh, they're actually sort okay. of like monkey bikes. They're oh, Honda yeah, uh, yeah. CT70s. I just, have, I, I just have one question about the episode. Huh. That exhaust. Allow me to play for you the music of my people. that on every car in the world. It that is, is the, the most best. wicked sounding car Wh ever. How? How? Explain the exhaust. I cannot explain it. It's a stock uh, LS6 with a small cam in it, but it has four inch exhaust with a bullet muffler, a Dynamax bullet about that long. The thing sounds so like an good. Indy car. Yeah, it's it unbelievable. So it actually yeah. sounds better than an Indy car. It, it is. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like a yeah. NASCAR stalker on, yeah. uh, the, on the bank. It's at ludicrous. I, does, I it can't make, tell you does it make power? Yeah, uh, well, on a 200 shot of nitrous, it does. <laughs> Now the idea was, of course, you were going. You, you figured you'd run fast enough in the drags that you get blown out of the class. And that you'd was go, the plan. And you didn't. We race at the eighth mile on this deal because, sadly, that's the only thing left in Southern California. Don't get me started on that rant. <laughs> but uh, in the eighth mile, some tracks will throw you out at 7:35, and others at 7:50 if you don't have a roll bar. It's NHRA rule, and we didn't have a roll bar. So my goal was to run quicker than a 7:50, and I went 7:52. But I'll call it a win. But that's not bad. That's like a, a high 11 second pass in a quarter mile. That's great. great for a 73 Chevy. Yeah. That weighs four grand with me in it. Yeah, it's not uh, bad. That's the, that's the last uh, Chevy product DeLorean was involved with, was the 73 Chevy truck. Really? Did not know that. Well, you see, you learn something yeah. new every day on wide open <laughs> throttle, folks. Those mini bikes, though, they were cool because I started riding motorcycles in the 70s. So I can remember when they came out. I mean, you kind of wondered what was Honda thinking? It was like, it was like, it was groovy and they'd been on they LSD or something like that. You meet the, the, the Beach people. Boys had oh, yeah. that little, you know, Go Honda Go or whatever that song was. Yeah. I mean, they were pop culture like that. You know, the, the litigious nature of uh, the U.S. didn't really show up till the 80s. So in the 70s, you know, <laughs> super brat, like, yeah. what, they yeah. really need a seatbelt? Sure, you got handles. The back, good. <laughs> yeah. So the truck's one of your um, unfinished projects. Do you actually have anything that you've ever finished? <laughs> is that a challenge? Um, but the I'm just curious. definition is that nothing's ever finished. But yes, I do have a couple of vehicles that roll around in so-called finished state, but not many. Yeah. Well, but Finnegan's always talking about how you have 500 cars stashed in various garages around Southern California. How, how it, accurate is that? People always ask this about me. It's like <laughs> almost urban legend. Um, <laughs> at my peak, I had 42 cars at the same time. And everyone says, how do you have that money? And the thing is, I don't. They're all $500 crap. But uh, I've narrowed it down to about 20. And some of them live here at the shop. Some of them are at home, and I have rental garages everywhere. I have often spent, you know, ten thousand dollars over fifteen years storing a five hundred dollar vehicle. It's kind of oh, yeah. Yeah. okay. We'll switch from one sort of V eight to another sort of V eight, and uh, equally epic, but a completely different country, built in Germany. Johnny, what were you driving recently? Yeah, I, think, I believe the full name is the Mercedes Benz C sixty three AMG Edition five hundred seven wagon. Um, but uh, right. it's almost like a special cigar. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a big long sticker along the side. No, 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 but you know, it's it's it's, it's a C-class station wagon with a 507 horsepower, 6.2 liter, naturally aspirated V8, which is awesome. But it's it's just funny. I was just thinking about it. You know, I on the Saturday before I went, we were filming the uh, the Viper versus the uh, the SLS Black Series, 
And then on Monday, I'm in the, uh, you know, the 507 horsepower wagon with only 451 pound feet of torque. And for the first five minutes, I'm like, oh man, this thing is so slow. <laughs> Which just shows how spoiled we are. But no, it's, it's a tremendous, tremendous little performance wagon. Like, I mean, it is, your point is, is valid. I mean, you think about how many cars you can buy right now with more than 500 horsepower. I think it's AMG sells 15 cars. <laughs> yeah, there's one that does the SOK. Well, does the CLA, the new CLA. Yeah, the CLA, but yeah, but I think they sell like 14 or 15 cars with over 500 horsepower in the US. I think we averaged over 500 horsepower best driver's car. I think it was like 500. It was yeah, it was easily over I think it was, it was six. Yeah. It was over six. No. 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 Make sure you're watching in August for best <laughs> driver's car, the full story. Yeah. But well, 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 let's go back to it. Is it, I just had the E63 wagon last night. I, Faster, uh, feel sharper. I mean, you, definitely you not quicker. There's not very, very few. Th as as you'll see if you watch Best Driver's Car, very few things on earth are faster than the E63 wagon. It's actually like a different class of car. The the, the 507, it feels much smaller. Um, it is it is much smaller. I mean, I think that the E63 wagon is 4,700 pounds, where this one's probably closer to like 39, maybe 4,000 pounds. Does it feel the lighter though? Yeah, yeah, it feels much lighter, much more nimble. Um, it, it's it's not turbocharged, so it's, it's the throttle response is much much better. Um, How is it in comparison to the '70 Fury 440? <laughs> That's really what I need to know. Uh, if, you know, it's stiffer. It, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a, a lot stiffer. stiffer. No, quieter. <laughs> more realistically, the Cadillac sports wagon. How does yeah. that compare? Yeah, boy, that Caddy would would actually back to Ed's point would split the difference between the two. Now, it, yeah. Now the one the one thing where the Cadillac is better is that it has it has a manual, whereas. Both, both the, the Mercedes, they're pretty good transmissions, but they're, they're just, they're, they're automatic. So they're not dual clutch, they're just a seven speed automatic. They can kind of switch gears quick, but something about the, you know, the immediacy of just being able to, oh, the, the Tremec is, is fantastic. So, so what is it with America that nobody wants to buy station wagons? I don't get it. Oh, it's, I got, I got, I got this one. The I got this one. This, the Audi, the Audi the guys, too, the it? Audi guys. The SUV me. killed them. In Germany, in, in most of Europe, the wagon, especially for like the Audi uh, A4 Avants, uh, the C-Class wagon, the E-Class wagons, these are the cars for men. They are, they are, they, they, they are what SUV, SUV drivers in America, that's, it's like, that's the analog. So guys over there in Europe, that means sporty. If you're a young dude, single, tough, tough, man. tough because you can, you can put all your gear in it, you put your bike on top, you put whatever, your kayak, that's, that's the idea. Over here we drive trucks and we drive SUVs, that's the replacement. There they want a car that's lower, a little faster, gets good fuel economy, has room for your friends and, and all your gear. It's, it's just a different mindset. The wagon's such a Here, great mix of car. not being a totally. minivan yes. and not being yes. a Suburban. It's, they're yes. genius, yes. I don't yes. get it. Yeah. And especially when you can get them with 507 horsepower yeah. and all. Exactly. And that's, that's the crazy thing, like in Germany, you know, if you're spending time on the Autobahn, the cars that pass you most often are really fast wagons, like the, yeah. like the five series yeah. wagons, yeah, the, the, the big Audi wagons, Mercedes wagons. Well, and part of it too is that they sell more wagons done with sedans. Yeah. You know. In yeah. my world, I'd way rather have a wagon yeah. than a sedan in yeah. the new Cadillac. Oh, the, the, oh it looks Sedans it looks are for turkeys, yeah. wagons are better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I've never, you know, I've never had a, a fast wagon. I've never really, you know, have not enjoyed it. Whether, whether it's the E55 uh, AMG wagon or the RS6 Audi, I've driven that, and the M5 wagon. I mean, they're just fantastic. Because, you, you know, it's the sort of car that, I think we all like because we drive so many really cool cars and we think, well, we can only afford maybe to buy one really good car. Mm -hmm. And if you distill all the properties of what we want. So we need something to haul stuff around, but we want performance and we want handling. I mean, I mean, a Hypo wagon does it. 100% right. I mean, the last two cars I bought have been WRX wagons. And if they would have made an STI wagon, I would have bought that. You know? And they, they just sadly don't. But yeah, I mean, it, and there's also there's something like slightly subversive about a really fast wagon, you know. And it's not it's not it's like like a really fast like a BMW X5 M, right? It's kind of just yeah, like it's yeah. Uh, vulgar maybe, but like well, the it, wagon the center of gravity is all wrong. It's like driving. It's like it's like driving. But it's a all, it's also just such a middle finger, you know. Like it's an antisocial, especially the X6 M, right? I mean, you're just like look at my money. But a wagon, it's like... But Detroit built a few muscle wagons. I remember in Motor Trend Classic a few years back, we did stories on like the, the full-size Ford Country Squire with a 429 and a oh, yeah. Chevy. You could get one with, with the big block Chevy. And but they weren't muscle wagons. It's just that's what people bought. You wanted to tow your boat, you went in and you got the big motor <laughs> in the wagon. You need a 454 yeah. to tow the boat, right? I don't know of a wagon back then that was marketed as a high-performance vehicle. 
No, they, they no had dragon the, wagon? No. Well, there were some of those. <laughs> but there was they had the 440 that was the same as what you would get in the GTX, but it was not marketed as a performance car. Has Hot Rod ever done a wagon project car? Oh, I don't know if we have. There's Might been be a whole lot of wagon hot rods, though, there yeah. for sure. Yeah. Could, could, be, could be an interesting We have a regular CTS V, a regular CTS wagon with the new VET. Motor. I'll take it. There you go. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. Or build a wagon body on a Corvette. And on that note, that's all we've got time for on this week on Wide Open Throttle. Uh, take care. We'll see you next week. Bye.